the public rather, what the public rather defines as beauty. And I draw your attention on these slides that are just publicly accessed images of famous people per se. And the first things we all look at, and I use this not to give you the obvious because you're all trained otolaryngologists, but more of how we explain the aging face to patients. Um, we really focused centrally in the triangle of the mid face and anything that's different, age related, trauma related, um, skin cancer related moles that deter our eyes from gazing at the central face draws attention. We learned this by looking at our face transplant work, why we care on the mid face. We look at facial paralysis work and gaze and where the eye directs and uh, where our focus is. So the mid face is quite important. So let's play on that. So when you look at this slide, you automatically, without even thinking about what my question is, you have a thought as to who this may be. You only base it on the mid face. Same slide, different mid face. And you want you quickly, your first judgment is who am I looking at? What is your first gut feeling as to who this is? And then when you separate the mid face, you realize how the mid face is centrally important to our identity, but it also is centrally important to how our patients perceive aging. And so it's really important that anytime we rejuvenate the face in all aspects, whether it's the most minimally invasive to most maximally invasive, uh, whether it's 30 years ago's types of techniques or today's techniques, how do we get back to this central area? So as we age, the mid-face triangle or inverted pyramid becomes more uh, back to its upright position. Things drop. What really drops is our mid-face malar fat pads. And that's really the focus of my talk today is how do we improve that area in addition to the techniques that we all know about facelifting and neck lifting or by itself as a standalone? So when we look at a child, the mid face is beautiful. Yes, they have deep nasolabial folds, but that's with smiling. The malar pads are elevated. Things are really nice. You see the cheeks. It gives the impression of youth. There's no righted. Everything is uh, no sun damage. We really see the mid face and rejuvenation. If you look at this in an adult version, if someone was to gain a lot of weight, they will actually look more youthful because we're adding volume. And what we see in this same individual is over the years, there are age-related changes, but the person's BMI has not changed. Their weight has not really changed over the years, yet the face by itself, especially the mid face, looks abnormally wide, more uh, obese. Why is that? Because a lot of the measures that we focus on are to add volume. But what we don't realize is the mid facial descent that has happened with aging, we have not corrected. We just added more to the tissues that are already there. When we look at youth, when we see what's called the hollowing or the OG curve, and these lines right along the mid face being elevated, the hollowing around this area, the malar fat pad being up, there's no trough deformities, the uh, medial canthus lies lower than the lateral canthus, the brow is positioned. You get that sense of beauty, youthfulness, all related yet again to the mid face. This OG curve, it's a mathematical illustration of what this is, but it really enhances our facial triangle by trying to recreate this curve in our more aging population. And this is what we try to focus on. So when we look at it more of a caricature, focusing on the eyes, again, I want to really direct the eyes because the eyes, if you do an outstanding facelift, mid facelift, rhinoplasty, Anything that's facial rejuvenation, I firmly believe you hit a home run for the patients when they get compliments about their eyes, even though you fix their nose, even though you fix their neck, 
because the eyes now focus and patients say, gosh, no one really noticed I had a facelift, but they're telling me I look really refreshed. I've been sleeping better. I didn't get a blepharoplasty, but my eyes look more obvious because the deterrent, whether it was a uh, crooked nose for a rhinoplasty patient, uh, mid-facial descent, aging face, we removed the areas that were aging that drew our attention to the eyes. We're looking at this distance between the lid margin to the nasal jugal fold as somewhat of our indicator before we do any kind of intervention and afterwards. The focus for many of us has always been the patients come in and say, Dr. Nabili, my nasal labial fold is, or this fold here that I hear about, it's really deep. I didn't have this when I was 20. I started getting it at 30 and now it's really prominent. Why is that? So I want to really focus and I try to educate my patients on cause and effect. The mid-face descent and the deep nasal labial fold are an effect of the malar fat pads and the mid-face descending. But what do we do routinely? We routinely fill the nasal labial fold and fill the nasal jugal folds, add more volume without redirecting the elevation. The face looks larger, looks more filled, and indirectly patients may think the lines are gone, but their youthfulness has not actually improved. So here's some good examples of patients where, yes, the nasolabial fold, this is taken from Juvederm, where it does make a market improvement and patients are happy. I do fillers. I, and I'll talk about where my practice is now focused on. When I first started my training, I was really involved in putting fillers pretty much everywhere whether it was around the nasal jugal fold, the tear troughs, the nasal labial folds, the temples. My practice today is isolated to only one area. I've learned through the years, through my own patients' follow-up experiences, my own struggles with what I see long-term, descent and migration of fillers, I only focus on the lips now. So when patients ask me, do you do filler? I very much say I only do it around the mouth. And the reason for that is that area you can actually elevate the lip and cause rejuvenation. But when I fill this area, I found through the years, the effect of surgery is far long lasting, but the surgeries were very long and involved. So how do we improve that? Here's a patient that we did. I still, you know, in a unique Case by case, I still did some fillers in the mid face, the cheek along this area, injecting here, indirectly lifted here. So in this prior slide, you fill this fold as directed by uh, the Juvederm uh, pamphlets. But when you actually think about cause and effect, if you fill this area, or in the next slide I'll demonstrate, you fill the temples, it gives the perception to others that you had a facial lift even though you didn't, because again, we're lifting areas that secondarily will raise the tissues to bring up the mid face. Here's another example. Early on, uh, and, and I think putting fillers in the temple, I used to do a lot of it because it was great. Patients felt better. They had hollowing that was reversed. Their mid face overall perceptually, the face looked more oval elevated. But I found that even though we put a filler here four or five years later, the patients would come in and they would have, Dr. Nabili, I have some edema around my eyelid. I'm like, how's that possible? You know, we didn't put any filler there. We didn't do anything. And lo and behold, we get an MRI and the filler. So what we've realized through the years is the fillers we thought that disappear actually last, whether it's the reaction to the filler. A lot of our fillers last for many, many months to years beyond what we thought. So I stopped doing it. So if I'm gonna put filler in the temple during facial rejuvenation, we'll do fat because we're gonna make temple incisions that we'll talk about shortly. And you can put fat in that area and it's far long lasting, not gonna migrate, will still give you that indirect effect. The purpose of this slide is to tell you again, you can create perceptions of mid-face rejuvenation by filling other areas of the face that look hollow, that draw attention to this. Now that this is full, the attention goes back to the eyes and wow, you look rejuvenated. And uh, it was an indirect uh, result. Okay, so we don't know what's changed for this individual, but if you think about it, youthfulness, the face looks rounded, less fold, 
this area, whether it's, was it weight gain? Was it filler? We don't know. And then we talk about potentially surgeries that may have had uh, the actual benefit in the end. So treat the cause with surgery is kind of where my philosophy and our, our institution's philosophy has kind of gone that direction, despite going the entire road of fillers, PRP, all the things that we, when I got out of training, we did a lot of. So it's become much more focused. So um, let's talk about the big picture. So how do we lift the face? So facelift, when you think of the term facelift, um, I usually tell my patients, patients come in and they either have two issues when they want to get the aging face. The most common one that my wonderful colleague will talk about later is the neck. People are bothered by the neck. I get that. And when we were in training, we always thought the best neck lift is a facelift. And patients are like, what are you talking about? I just want my neck. But if you lift the lower third of the face, where facelifts in general used to be thought of as the lower third of the face, we elevate it, the neck looks great. So that's great. But it improves the jowls, but does it really improve the nasolabial folds? I'm talking classically when we think of what is a standard facelift. Um, again, we don't really just, we disregard the mid face up until the last 10 to 15 years where we've now shifted, especially in the last five years uh, with um, uh, one of our colleagues uh, and a good friend of ours, Dr. Andrew Giacono, where really has given the public eye about the term deep plane, where what does that mean? Patients come to us now and they're like, well, I think a standard facelift is either it's a mini weekend lift that I can do it under local and you're not gonna do a lot. Or I think of now, I read in New York Times and it says, I'm gonna get a deep plane. What is that Dr. Nabili? Explain it to me. So that area is now maybe focusing more on the mid face and we'll get into that. The reason why we, we, we used to worry so much about it was facial nerve risk. And then the other reason that it lost popularity in the last 15 years and now is gaining again, fillers became very popular, but then we're learning. So the tide may turn back to surgery. So when we look at the aging phase where these are the areas that we're trying to address the, my focus is really this malar fat pad and the arcus marginalis, the periosteum around the periorbital area, because as we lift this, if we lift it without releasing the tissues here, when we lift the mid phase, you accentuate the nasal jugal fold indirectly. So it would be great to lift this entire area. How do we do it? What we have to realize is, well, we're not going to fix the bone. I'm not an implant expert. I don't do, I only do chin implants, but there are some real experts in both facial plastic surgery and uh, plastic surgery that focus on implants. And they're amazing because they fix the bony contours that do change over time. But we're trying to override that. So uh, this is just kind of showing the gradations of aging. Yet again, focusing around the eye, talking about the malar pad dropping and the fine ridges and the folds. When we look at subunits of the mid face where we can divide them into a malar, the lid cheek region, the nasal labial. When we look at the malar fat pad and it descends, as we look back at this slide, then we look at it, what's really happening. It's the malar fat pad below the suborbicularis oculi fat or the SUF, all below the areas that we focus on doing our lower eyelid blepharoplasty, a different fat pad that we're focusing on. And again, this is showing where this fat pad has dropped and it basically unravels the hollowing that's happening. And so many times we do fat repositioning, but if we were to lift the mid phase in a lot and a large majority of those patients, we may not need to reposition the fats that we thought we needed to do. So in the, in the facelift criteria of today, the main ligament that everyone either worries about or discusses and the real truth of it is um, my approach to facelifts and the zygomatico cutaneous ligament, which is this ligament right in this area that pretty much tethers our ability to elevate the mid face is something that I think it has to do with the surgeon's comfort level balance with the patient's true needs. In other words, at UCLA, we don't look at it as we're always going to do a deep plane. We're always going to do a high SMAS. No, not at all. We look at it as it's patient-centric, age criteria, degree of uh, descent, and how we focus the degree of my deep plane facelifts, my colleagues that I work with, my mentor, Dr. Keller, is every patient's unique and the degree of release will depend on uh, the patient. So here is the zygomatic ligaments. Here is the release of it. We see the zygomaticus uh, major muscle. 
this area by releasing this ligament we are now able to release the fat pads as we lift the face up and suture it but this is a lot of surgery and how do we do those surgeries to get this type of mid face elevation this patient had nothing else done. This is an example of an isolated mid facelift that I will show others, but where the jowl remains, the nasal labial fold is less, the OG curve is improved, and the mid face has just improved. So our facelift approaches to mid face lifting, I look at them as there's only three ways to do it. Deep plane, high SMAS, high SMAS plus deep plane. I won't go into the details because uh, one is we, we want to be focused on mid face, but these are the three ways to get to the mid face currently. Uh, Dr. Andrew Giacono uh, has written some really impeccable work on this, has really modified Calvin Johnson's uh, deep plane entry point and Sam Hamra, where you enter from the lateral canthus to the angle of the mandible. And what we're doing is we enter the deep plane exactly where the zygomatic cutaneous ligament is, and we're bypassing the area of where the frontal branch of the facial nerve injury would be. Your main risk would be the zygomaticus branches. So you get this really marked elevation, 90 degrees to the nasal labial fold. You get the mid face lift, you get your neck lift, and you achieve both of the goals that we set out uh, with the beginning of this talk in, in focusing on the mid face. Then we have the standard low SMAS, which is what we all kind of trained. It's safe, we're staying low, we're leaving the ligaments in, but we're doing our standard elevation of the neck and the lower third of the face. But then Dr. Timothy Martin popularized and wrote papers on the high SMAS lift, where we're gonna get that mid face lift by entering the SMAS at a higher level, but the high SMAS has the incisional points at risk for the frontal branch of the facial nerve. Well, our approach at UCLA, and we published this, is it's really our master lift. And this was really uh, created by uh, Dr. Keller. And our focus is, well, we do a high SMAS deep plane. We basically do a hybrid where we're not only entering our high SMAS, but we are going into the deep plane. So here is the standard deep plane entry point that Dr. Giacono popularized. Here is the uh, Dr. Martin high SMAS, SMAS only elevation. But what we do is we enter in the high SMAS as our deep plane entry point. So we elevate the zygomatic cutaneous ligament as well as all of the SMAS. Are we doing too much? Well, as you know, we wanna kind of look at the data and compare. When we actually published this, we looked at is our horizontal vector of pull and our vertical vector of pull, how much more elevation do we get? And it was significant. We had much more pull in both directions when we did a low SMAS versus high SMAS deep plane lift. And the level of skin that we excised was actually more significant. Is the surgery a little bit higher risk? Yes, because you're at risk for the frontal branch of the facial nerve. I encourage everyone, if you're if you a really good paper to look up uh, that's classic and is still in modern times, it really redefines the frontal branch of the facial nerve by Andrew Trussler, T-R-U-S-S-L-E-R -S -S -E and P-R-S. And they really studied anatomically and where we classically think about where the frontal branch of the facial nerve is in terms of the zygoma, it's basically 15 to 18 millimeters above the zygoma is where the frontal branch of the facial nerve actually becomes much more superficial than we assumed. So staying on the zygoma, entering high SMADs, even up to a centimeter above, you can very safely avoid frontal branch injury. Okay, back to now the last few slides and a video for you. So how do I focus the patients on, or how do we get our audience here to say, okay, look, I'm not, I, if I do want to do a facelift, I get it. If I don't want to do a mid uh, deep plane to get to the mid phase, could I just do something where I'm not going to focus on the jowls? Could I do an office, not an office space, but a procedure under local in the procedure room or Mac or general and lift the mid face successfully? You may think I'm gonna show, show you a thread lift. I don't believe in thread lifts. They disappear. They don't do well. You're not lifting the periosteum. But what we do is it's a subperiosteal dissection where, and I'll have a video to go through all the details. We, we do our standard temporal lift, very safe. We'll talk about the plane of dissection, but the goal is to reach the malar fat pad through a minimal axis incision and be able to lift this up with no other surgery anywhere else safely. 
what plane are we in? Well, the plane of dissection is under the temporal parietal fascia or simply foot when we do otology and we're trying to get a temporalis fascia graft. When you get down onto the temporalis muscle, that's the plane you want to be on, the fascia right on top of it. And if we stay safe, this superficial temporal artery has a vein that goes with it, which is our sentinel vein. We worry about the nerve in that area, but if we stay right on that uh, temporalis fascia right here, we see the sentinel vein, the temporal parietal fascia, our temporal incision is very safe. When we see this, we cauterize it and we're in the plane. About five years ago, when I started doing some mid-face lifting, uh, we were really like, okay, well, let's put this implant because the implant is robust. It's endo time. We use it for mid-face for our forehead brow lifts. And these prongs last for about 18 months and it really is pulled. But I will tell you, technically to do this, under local, almost impossible. Even under anesthesia, it's a lot of work because sometimes you end up having to make an incision in the mouth in order to see your implant. And then this incision, and this is a really big, um, relatively big area when you're trying to pass this implant and patients may feel it. So we were doing this and then we're like, let's go back to the Gore-Tex because Gore-Tex was used a while ago and it was just kind of pulling the skin in the eighties and nineties. And we said, why don't we go into the subperiosteal level? So what we do with either scenario is we suture everything to the temporalis fascia and that endotime would dissolve. But let's go back to our suture assisted mid facelift. And what we do here is we have our same entry point. We pass a Gore-Tex suture and we enter in two points of fixation that are very minuscule. And we enter the mid face and the malar fat pad at the level of the nasal labial fold or just above it. And when we dissect from here to here, as we're elevating, we lift off the entire periosteum around the orbit. So when we hook on the mid malar fat pad and we actually pull, we're able to pull the malar fat pad successfully and the subperiosteum is already released. So when the arcus and the mid face over time reattaches, it's suspended in a new position. So this video, and the audio works well. It's about good, uh, our fellow Dr. Eggersat, we did the video last year. It's gonna, um, it, it, I think it'll help in terms of the narration. So, and then we'll take some questions and I'll show some results afterwards. The results at the end of this video are the classic results we've had from our older papers. And then I'll show some more recent results as well with Dr. Keller and myself. And hopefully you can hear the audio. We tested it earlier. It'll come on in a minute. For the subperiosteal mid face lift, we will make our incision along the trajectory of our lift. So along a line connecting the ala and just lateral to the lateral canthus, which is approximately perpendicular to the nasolabial fold. It is here that a two to three centimeter incision is made in the hairline, similar to the incision utilized in an endoscopic brow lift. This incision can be made in a trichophytic manner if desired. Regardless, meticulous sterile technique is prudent as we will be utilizing permanent suspension suture material in the case. Using electrocautery, the dissection is carried through the temporal parietal fascia down to the areolar layer, which covers the deep temporal fascia. This allows us to carry our dissection inferiorly with the facial nerve safely above us. Using blunt dissection under direct visualization, we can elevate in this plane until we encounter the sentinel vein, also known as the temporal parietal vein. The vein is thoroughly cauterized using bipolar cautery, keeping in mind that the frontal branch of the facial nerve runs in close proximity to the vein. At this point, we can use a periosteal elevator to transition deeply to the subperiosteal plane at the malar eminence. In elevating the periosteum off of the malar eminence and the zygoma, we restrict our elevation to the medial one third of the zygoma to protect the facial nerve. You can see a small periosteal elevator is used to initially find the plane of dissection in the subperiosteal plane, and then we switch to a larger elevator in order to complete the dissection. The periosteum is quite adherent in this region but it is important to get a good elevation if we want to ensure adequate lift from this procedure. The patient's nasolabial fold is marked preoperatively in a sitting position, and it is here that we make a small stab incision. 
Assembled here, we have a 3.0 EPTFE Gore-Tex suture and a 3.0 Vicryl suture, passed through two Keith needles and clamped at each end with hemostats. We pass one Keith needle through our stab incision, hook the fat pad, and pass it deep to the periosteum into our dissection plane. We then angle it upward to exit our temporal incision. Each time a suture exits the wound, it is clamped with a hemostat to prevent it from falling back into the wound. We then repeat this process through the same stab incision with the second Keith needle, taking care each time to avoid the infraorbital nerve. It is best practice to use the outfrict or any retractor to protect the facial soft tissues and the facial nerve running superficial to this dissection when passing the Keith needles. With our sutures in place, we can see how the dermis is captured in our Gore-Tex loop, causing dimpling of the skin. The vicral suture is used in a giggly saw motion to release the dermis as seen there, while maintaining the Gore-Tex suture's traction on the malar fat pads. Following the release, we have appropriate elevation of the fat pads without skin dimpling. The vicral suture is then removed and a French eye needle is used to pass one tail of the Gore-Tex suture loop through the deep temporal fascia. The two tails of the loop are then tied to the desired tension as dictated by the amount of lift observed in the mid-face. To prevent loosening over many years, the suture should be tied with at least 10 throws and the tails kept long. Though infection rates are reduced in the absence of a Gore-Tex swatch, it is important to close the temporal parietal fascia over the Gore-Tex suture to reduce the possibility of infection or extrusion. Then the scalp is closed with staples or sutures per surgeon preference, which concludes the operation. At the termination of the case, the nasolabial folds are effaced, tear troughs are mildly reduced, malar mounding is improved, and a nice OG curve is present all after about a 30 minute procedure with a percutaneous subperiosteal mid-face lift. All right, so thank you for that. And basically uh, these are some examples of the distance post-op where we have blunting of the nasolabial fold and then the distance from the nasal jugal fold to the lid margin has been reduced. When we look at the elevation we see some hollowing here and now this is elevated we have more of an og curve here and then here a more significant uh lessening where again we would have injected this area added more volume whereas now with a mid-face lift we rejuvenated everything the eyes look more present they don't look tired and lo and behold this triangular malar fat pad has now been elevated the distance here has been reduced so uh in summary uh, you know our focus now has been really when we do a facelift, we end up doing our any facelift approach. And I would say that most of our patients do end up needing some type of mid facelift. And this Gore-Tex has really helped us. Um, this was actually initially popularized by Dr. Keller, Dr. Sasaki years ago. And we went through a whole circle of the elevation of the periosteum. And then the last part is, if you notice, um, the double suture with the Vicryl. When you're pulling the malar fat pad, it puckers the skin. So the benefit and the uh, basically the genius of uh, Dr. Keller and, and Dr. Saki was to have that kind of motion where you use the Vicryl, you pull it out, but as you're ratcheting it or giggly saw version, the puckering releases and you actually capture the malar fat pad. It's a subtle pearl that uh, again, offline, feel free to email me, contact me to go over this, but this is something that we do. I think it's user-friendly. The learning curve is not too robust. Um, and I think it'll make your patients far more happier uh, in the long run. Thank you so much for your time. I'm open to any questions. Thank you. That was a, a great presentation. My question is actually about um, people who have a question regarding 
skin changes that are associated with too much sun and acti you know actinic changes and um, in terms of if they want to do laser resurfacing versus a facelift, you know, what is the recommended order of that? Do you, you yeah, know, so it's a great question. So it depends. Usually most patients complaints are always around the perioral area um, and the fine right is in the eyelid. So it depends on your institution's ability to bring a laser into the room. So I think if you can do the laser at the same time, but it's not the lifted skin portion, because remember the, uh, we're not really getting into the perioral area, the mental area, mentalis area. So you could do the laser at the same time or then the, but oftentimes if there's a combination of the advanced glow gal staging, sun damage, then we, my usual rule is six months. And it depends on the patient. Really, some patients are wanting to have the surgery right away. The problem with that is if I had an ideal scenario, I do the treatments first and then wait six months because your facelift will look better. If you do it first, and then you do it later, it's okay, but just forewarn the patients that all of those lines are gonna be oriented in a not favorable position if they're very deep to begin with. What I mean is we're doing vertical pulls now, so the relaxed skin tension lines that are all going in one direction may have these odd shapes now. And as long as you educate the patients, um, that's the best way that I, I plan that. In my institution, we don't have the ability to bring the lasers up to the OR at the same time. Uh, so it's been a challenge, but that, and I hope that answers it. And then tretinoins, six months in terms of retin-A and those things, because we won't have any sun damage from it. And I do feel dermabrasion, and I don't know if my colleagues have used it. You know, I do it for our skin cancer reconstructions, Leanna, and, and in the head and neck world, you, we have a lot of those scars. I tell you, if the patient would really tolerate that long months of downtime, dermabrasion, medium uh, peels give a phenomenal facial rejuvenation that is probably just kind of dated now because we people don't want the downtime. Thank you. Of course, thank you. Anyone else have any questions for Dr. Nabili? If not, we'll move on to Dr. Barrett. Thank you so much, everyone. I actually have to go to another meeting, but I, I hope to see the video and see my, uh, my, the recordings of my colleagues, which I uh, hold in high esteem. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for your participation. Thank you so much. All right, let me see if I can get uh, this to work. Dr. Baird is one of my colleagues at Duke. He is an associate professor in the Division of Facial Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. And also a colleague of mine. Hello. <laughs> Can everybody hear me? Yes. All right. Um, well, that was a great, uh, a great talk. Um, I've been here for the last, uh, I think, uh, five years now. And so um, uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk. Uh, thanks for the invitation, Leanna. Um, I'm going to uh, cover, um, you know, considerations uh, for the aging neck. There'll be a little bit of overlap uh, with um, with the prior talk, um, <clears throat> um, but I'm going to try to draw some uh, distinctions uh, as it comes to the uh, to the neck and lower face. Uh, so um, changes uh, in the neck uh, associated with uh, you know with aging uh, is a is a pretty common reason for uh, patients seeking care in an aesthetic office. Uh, you know, patients will come in commonly uh, complaining of increased neck laxity, platysmal banding, uh, or jowling. Uh, as well as um, increase of mental fullness. So a restoration of a, of a youthful uh, jawline and neck uh, is it's an important component of uh, facial rejuvenation and is uh, you know, an important goal for patients and, and doctors uh, when uh, considering aging face uh, surgery. Let's see if this... Uh, so although um, uh, aesthetic ideals may, may differ uh, among various surgeons and, and patients, um, um, most um, of the time, we're trying to uh, recreate a neck and, and jawline uh, that has, uh, you know, five uh, meets five uh, distinct uh, visual criteria. Um, so these include uh, a distinct inferior mandibular border, uh, a subhyoid depression, a visible thyroid cartilage bulge, a visible anterior sternocleidomastoid muscle border, and a cervical mental angle that is between somewhere between 105 and 120 degrees. Uh, so a, a youthful neck, as, in, uh, as you can see in this patient, uh, uh, has good skeletal support, 
a good neck height, an acute cervical mental angle, and a distinct uh, um, inferior mandibular border, as well as an accentuated anterior border sternocleidomastoid. Uh, so um, facial uh, and, and neck aging is a result of a, a confluence of factors that uh, act in concert over time. So intrinsic, extrinsic factors such as gravity uh, exerts a, a constant force on skin and underlying tissues, uh, as well as the uh, retaining uh, ligaments of the face and neck. Uh, additionally, sun uh, can cause histiologic damages to the skin, uh, which includes uh, fragmentation of the collagen, um, uh, and elastin fibers decreases in extracellular matrix, ground substance, uh, as well as decreases in hyaluronic acid uh, um, and uh, thinning of, of the epidermis. Uh, intrinsic factors include uh, loss of bone mass in the facial skeleton, loss of skin elasticity, uh, decreased uh, dermal thickness, and, and increased fat deposition in some areas and deflation in others, as well as lo uh, loss of muscular tone and atrophy. Um, and then finally, uh, weakening of the uh, facial and uh, neck retaining ligaments. So all these factors culminate in an aged appearing neck, uh, in an aged neck you often see, uh, as we said uh, earlier, significant jowling, an indistinct inferior mandibular border, uh, excess submental uh, neck fat with redundant and lax skin, uh, platysmal cording, and, and an obtuse cervical mental angle. Uh, you can also see um, uh, hypertrophy of the anterior belly, the digastric muscles, and then descent of uh, the submandibular glands. And, and this is exa an example of a patient with uh, significant uh, aging of the neck. And you can see how uh, she has increased uh, neck laxity and, and um, an obtuse cervical mental angle. So when evaluating uh, patients as candidates for neck rejuvenation, uh, there's several factors to consider. Uh, you need to take in, into account uh, the patient's uh, specific anatomy. Uh, what what, what age-related changes are actually there uh, for the patient. Uh, so, um, you know, what anatomic uh, changes are present. So, for example, a patient may have some skin laxity and redundancy, um, but uh, may uh, be bothered primarily by excessive uh, submental uh, uh, fat. And this can be addressed uh, with a more limited uh, approach, such as Kybella or submental liposuction. Alternatively, uh, you know, patients may have a lot of skin laxity and skin redundancy, and uh, you know, the, this technique may not be uh, the uh, uh, ideal approach. The other thing to consider are what anatomic factors are going to limit uh, the result. Uh, so, you know, um, ideal surgical candidates tend to have uh, redundant excessive skin and totic musculature uh, to uh, a degree that uh, significant improvement can be achieved. Uh, whereas uh, someone who's a, maybe a poor surgical candidate uh, will have heavier, thicker skin and soft tissue, uh, may have uh, maybe obese uh, with heavy uh, adipose deposits near the jawline, uh, a low hyoid or a weak chin uh, with poor projection and an obtuse uh, cervical mental angle. Uh, so, you know, uh, on the right here, you see a couple different examples of a you know patient uh, who, are, who are different from each other, and uh, you know the patient below may not. Uh, you know, may still be, um, you know, a, a surgical candidate, but they, they need to be counseled appropriately that the uh, uh, surgical results may not uh, necessarily be a, as optimal. The other thing uh, to take into account are changes that, uh, age-related changes that occur outside of the neck. Uh, and uh, again, this is uh, well covered in our, in our prior talk, uh, but you will often see in deepening of the nasal labial folds, uh, marionette lines, uh, and jowling. And uh, if these uh, issues aren't addressed in concert with uh, the neck changes, this can uh, result in you know, poor patient satisfaction and a poor result. Uh, so most of the time, um, uh, both the uh, uh, face and uh, jawline, uh, lower face and jawline are addressed in concert uh, with, uh, with the neck in the form of a, a facelift. In addition to uh, <clears throat> evaluation of uh, age-related changes, uh, general and systemic uh, considerations are an important part of the pretreatment evaluation in an aging neck patient. Ideal candidates uh, should have no systemic or uh, complicating factors uh, uh, to affect their healing ability uh, or safety during elective procedures. Uh, anticoagulant medications such as aspirin and osrotos should be able to be stopped prior to surgery. And then patients with systemic conditions um, that can affect postoperative healing uh, may need to be dissuaded from surgery. 
Uh, smoking uh, should ideally be discontinued uh, three to six months uh, before any uh, surgical procedures. And then uh, finally, the patient uh, should be psychologically stable uh, with realistic expectations and goals. Um, so, uh, you know, when uh, planning uh, treatment options, you know, it's important to consider the patient goals uh, before uh, proceeding with any elective procedure. Uh, the provider uh, needs to ensure that their expectations match the treatment options that are offered. Uh, appropriate counseling uh, needs to be provided to ensure that, uh, that, that we can meet their expectations. You know, additionally, if, uh, if patients can't, cannot set uh, realistic goals, then it, it may be best uh, not to intervene. Uh, and in addition to patient expectations, you know, there are financial uh, con constraints that can, that can guide treatment considerations, and, and this needs to be taken into account uh, when counseling patients uh, and managing expectations. So some of the treatment options that are available, uh, while they may be less expensive, may not may be less likely to achieve you know, significant clinical results. Uh, so the primary options uh, you know, fall into to categories of surgical and non-surgical modalities. And in general, the non-surgical modalities are less likely to achieve as dramatic a response as surgical and inter intervention. Uh, but that said, you know, appropriate patient selection can achieve a substantial clinical response and, and result in, in high pa patient satisfaction. And I'll review some of the options that are that are available. Um, so one of the uh, uh, among the non-invasive options are injectables. Uh, they're fairly simple to administer. Uh, there's low; they have low risk profiles, and and they can be administered in the office under minimal to no anesthesia. Uh, Kybella is a newer uh, drug on the market. Uh, that's a synthetic uh, deoxycholic acid, uh, which is FDA approved for uh, treatment of submental fat, and it, it causes targeted destruction of adipocytes uh, via lysis of cell membranes, which ultimately reduces the amount of submental fat. Uh, usually, it can, it can take up to six uh, sessions based monthly to achieve a, a desired result uh, or desired reduction in submental fat, though results can often be seen in as few as two sessions. Uh, the patient on the right uh, had uh, two uh, uh, sessions with Kybella, and you can see that there's a response, albeit it's relatively, um, relatively slight. Uh, and this can be a good option for patients uh, where the significant neck binding is uh, submental adiposity. Uh, the patients with prominent baptismal bands and skin laxity may not be good candidates. And this is because, you know, if you're, if you're uh, reducing the amount of submental fat, you may actually accentuate uh, platysmal bands. Uh, Botox is another option to treat, uh, uh, that can treat vertical platysmal bands and rides. Uh, the results can take, you know, several days and last up to, uh, uh, to, can take several days to be seen and last up to six months. Uh, patients um, are likely to benefit uh, from Botox if they have a good cervical skin elasticity and uh, defined platysmal bands uh, with minimal fat descent. Uh, and this is a good option for patients uh, who are, uh, you know, for older patients that are not good surgical candidates or in patients who have already had neck rejuvenation with some residual platysmal banding uh, or younger patients uh, where surgery uh, may not be uh, an option that one, that, that's entertained. Uh, additionally, uh, fillers are, are an option. I typically use uh, facial fillers along uh, if I if I do use them along the inferior border of the mandible. I don't routinely use them in the neck. So, among the uh, various non-invasive modalities uh, are those that are aimed at uh, rejuvenation of the neck skin. Uh, chemical peels, dermabrasion, and lasers um, are are uh, options that can produce results in photodamaged skin. Um, with chemical peels and dermabrasion, it can be a little bit more difficult to control the uh, depth of tissue removal. Uh, and, you know, for that reason, lasers are typically, you know, more in favor. Uh, the CO2 ablative laser uh, can, can, can show significant improvements in skin color, texture, uh, tightening, and ridids. Um, the Erbium YAG laser is another uh, good option that uh, produces less uh, you know, thermal damage. Um, and can be another uh, useful option. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind is that the neck skin uh, has a greater risk of scarring uh, than the face uh, due to uh, fewer uh, pilosebaceous units. Um, and so uh, usually a more conservative approach uh, needs to be taken for uh, in neck skin. Another uh, modality uh, for non-invasive uh, treatment is uh, intense focus ultrasound. Uh, Rather than uh, surgical treatment uh, with direct excision and repositioning, uh, intense focus ultrasound uh, works by you know, thermal tissue disruption 
uh, and uh, the healing response to obtain the desired result. Uh, this works with uh, short pulses of ultrasound at high frequencies, and the goal is to heat the tissue adequately to achieve a collagen response that will result in improvement in the neck, um, in the neckline, and skin tightness. Um, so uh, for this technique, I think you know, patient selection is pretty paramount. The ideal uh, patient is typically younger, uh, with more uh, with a more robust healing response. Um, there's really uh, relatively limited uh, peer-reviewed literature on the effectiveness, although there are subjective physician and patient reports of improvement. Uh, the measurable, measurable benefits have been <clears throat> difficult uh, to determine, and so for this reason, uh, you know, I think you know uh, some of my colleagues who have who use this have been uh, relatively have not been as happy with the uh, with with the outcomes um, in some of their patients. That said, the appropriately selected patient, um, you know, you can achieve a response. So overall, the gold standard uh, for neck rejuvenation uh, remains a uh, surgical option. Uh, submental liposuction, corset submentoplasty, uh, uh, an isolated neck lift, or a neck lift in concert with a facelift can provide immediate and substantial improvement. And uh, you know, these surgical treatments, uh, you know, tailored to the individual needs of the patient, can offer uh, long-term results. Uh, you know, the typical surgical approaches uh, are either through you know midline submental approach or a lateral access facelift approach or a combination of the two. Uh, you know, a midline approach uh, provides excellent access to the central compartment of the neck uh, and allows uh, for direct treatment of some mental fats, uh, platysmal cording and digastric hypertrophy. Um, lateral access, uh, you know, is an important component of, of, of managing the neck as it, as it allows you to have access to the uh, SMAS and, and uh, allows for skin redraping. So through uh, a midline access, uh, the submental fat uh, can be uh, can be addressed pretty easily. Uh, cervical liposuction can be performed through a midline uh, stab incision, and uh, uh, as well as access incisions laterally at the lobules. And usually, a, a three millimeter liposuction cannula is used, uh, and dry tunnels are created uh, with applying suction. Uh, care needs to be taken to you know, preserve a cup of subcutaneous tissue. Uh, subcutaneous fat, so as not to create dermal scarring or dimpling of the skin. And then, um, you know, submental liposuction uh, is typically geared at uh, addressing supraplatysmal fat, but doesn't ad address subplatysmal fat. Uh, direct inc incisions, another uh, option that is ad advantageous <coughs> in that the uh, central neck uh, fat compartment can be addressed through a two to three centimeter incision. Um, and this approach is, uh, approach is useful as the interplatysmal fat can be excised uh, directly. Uh, the surgeon has uh, the ability to kind of control the amount of fat that's removed. It also helps uh, with access to the um, medial borders of the platysma for subplatysmal dissection and midline uh, platysmoplasty. Uh, again, with, the, uh, with a, uh, a midline uh, access incision, you can uh, uh, gain access to platysmal banding. Um, and which a lot of elderly patients uh, will have. Uh, there's a, a, a lot of different types of um, options that I won't go over in terms of um, you know, a platysmoplasty, but I think some of the important uh, pearls for uh, platysmoplasty are to uh, undermine in, in the subplatysmal plane uh, to, in order to create uh, a plane for scarification to occur. And then when you're doing your platysmoplasty and you're approximating the medial edges uh, together, uh, to grab uh, the deeper tissue, so the mylohyoid and, and towards the hyoid, hyoid uh, to prevent uh, bowstringing of the platysma. Also, when uh, doing a platysmoplasty, you can address digastric hypertrophy if it's present and indirectly excise this uh, with cautery. Uh, some surgeons uh, will um, address some mandibular glantosis uh, through this approach, uh, but I think that the uh, risks of either excision or partial excision of the submandibular glands uh, outweigh the potential benefits. And usually with a SMAS suspension, you can tuck the submandibular glands uh, back up um, with, your, with your SMAS approach. And so this is just a kind of a picture showing uh, uh, the decusation of the, uh, or the lack of decusation of the platysma. This is actually a direct uh, approach. So this is not the kind of axis that you see uh, through a, a two centimeter uh, submental incision. Uh, so during uh, during neck lifting, the, the two most essential layers to manipulate are the uh, skin subcutaneous tissues and the SMAS. And modification of these layers are uh, always almost always performed through a lateral lateral access or facelift incision. 
and is a part of a neck lift that, you know, facelift almost always uh, needs to be performed con concurrently if you're going to, uh, in order to address and restore a distinct mandibular border, uh, the lower face has to be addressed at the time of the neck lift. Um, and there are several variations of the type of incisions uh, for you know, uh, obtaining lateral access. Um, and there's different uh, reasons uh, for uh, the different var uh, variations of the, of the incisions, but I, I typically will make an incision along the um, uh, temporal uh, hairline and then um, extend it along the apex of the tragus. Um, you want to be careful not to um, make it uh, posterior to the tragus, uh, as when you're uh, skin, uh, redraping skin, you can uh, blunt uh, the tragus um, if your uh, incision is, is, is retrotragal. And then also make the incision uh, a couple millimeters below the uh, lobule of the ear uh, to preserve the natural sulcus. And then uh, the posterior incision is usually a couple millimeters onto the conchal skin um, as that uh, incision will often settle into the um, uh, push rick or sulcus uh, after uh, surgery during the healing phase. So there are, are several different um, methods for SMAS modification. Uh, most of, you know, all the techniques that, that are used, modern techniques uh, involve some form of SMAS modification. And um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll review some of those options. So uh, the SMAS application uh, is a suture suspension technique that involves repositioning of the SMAS through gathering and folding uh, the SMAS uh, using sutures. And uh, this, um, the reposition of the SMAS can be performed in multiple vectors depending on how the, the sutures are placed. And there have uh, been several different types of suture suspension techniques that have been described. Uh, max, the max lift, uh, the O lift, uh, um, the buckle cerclage. There, there are, are, are a lot of different um, techniques that have been described, but the, the main idea is that uh, the SMAS is suspended uh, with sutures uh, to lift the SMAS primarily in a vertical vector. Um, and plication can be done with either permanent or uh, absorbable sutures. You just need a suture that's going to suspend the SMAS long enough for uh, scarification to occur. So uh, the advantages of a of plication is that it's, it's relatively safe uh, approach. It's, uh, it's faster than some of the uh, you know, more extensive uh, SMAS, uh, sub-SMAS dissections or deep plant approaches and the SMAS uh, lift vector can be independent of the skin draping. <clears throat> and so this is just an example of a patient whose primary concern was the neck um, and, and the, um, didn't have um, concerns regarding the lower face or the mid face. And so uh, just, uh, and she was a, a pretty good surgical candidate. And so the, uh, we approached this with a SMAS plication technique <clears throat> and uh, you can see that uh, just with suspension using sutures, you can get a pretty reasonable result um, with a uh, with a application technique. Uh, so most of the uh, non-plication SMAS techniques involve some degree of SMAS undermining, uh, and the degree of undermining uh, can be you know limited or extensive. And um, sub-SMAS dissection uh, uh, can be limited to the anterior border of the parotid. Uh, and this is typically referred to as a short SMAS flap, uh, which is a, you know, deemed as a relatively safe approach um, because it poses less risk to the facial nerve. Uh, but this uh, you know, is rel provides relatively minimal benefit to the mid face and uh, nasolabial folds uh, as it doesn't really adequately address uh, the facial retaining ligaments. Uh, more extensive SMAS elevation can be performed, uh, which theoretically improves the mobility of the SMAS. Um, and then uh, face and neck lifts where the SMAS is elevated separate from the skin flap, uh, the, the SMAS can be uh, you know, redraped in a, in a different uh, vector. Uh, the SMAS is, uh, in this case, the SMAS is typically pulled in a more vertical direction and the skin uh, can be redraped a little bit more laterally, although this approach has a greater propensity for creating uh, a lateral sweep deformity along the lower face and mandible. So, um, you know, the main limitation of the SMAS techniques is, or is that the dissection usually doesn't involve release of the uh, facial retaining ligaments, which can uh, limit the degree of elevation of the platysma, SMAS, and neck skin. So the deep plane uh, allows you to access the zygomatic cutaneous ligament, which was you know, discussed previously, as well as the mandibular cutaneous and cervical retaining ligaments. And upon release, uh, you have a fully mobilized flap that you can reposition the malar fat pad. You can soften the malolabial fold and jowls in addition to uh, removing both skin laxity and platysmal banding. And, and this has been discussed extensively by uh, Andrew Giacono, 
uh, in one of his cadaver studies, he compared the deep plane technique to suture suspension and found that he was able to achieve a 554% uh, greater redraping of the submental skin laxity with a deep plane approach. Uh, and this approach uh, often obviates the need for a mid-line submentoplasty in a lot of cases uh, because of the amount of mobility that you have uh, with, uh, with, the sky, with the composite flap. And oftentimes a midline platysmoplasty can, can limit the amount of lateral redraping that can be accomplished um, with this technique. So uh, the, the primary concern is that this uh, you know, poses greater risk to the facial nerve, uh, that it's a more extensive dissection and, and can be more time consuming. Um, however, the, you know, the rates reported in the literature of uh, facial nerve injury are, are comparable to the other techniques. So uh, one of the keys uh, when it comes to uh, you know, neck lifting is that the, the vector of the lift, regardless of what technique is selected, uh, needs to be primarily in a vertical vector. Uh, and this results in improved draping of the neck skin and avoids uh, distraction of the medial platysmal edges. Uh, the, the average angle of ideal redraping should be about 60 degrees, though it can vary from anywhere from 40 to 70 degrees, depending on, on the patient. Um, and usually the angle of redraping uh, parallels the zygomaticus musculature. So that's usually a good uh, rule of thumb. And, and this vector uh, of pull uh, effectively removes the anterior skin laxity. So another thing I, I want to uh, point out is that, uh, you know, the direct approach uh, would, uh, can also be an effective approach to, uh, to skin uh, to neck laxity. Uh, so this can be a good option uh, in patients with heavier skin uh, and less skin laxity. It can create uh, pretty reproducible and reliable results uh, to the cervical uh, mental angle. Uh, and it, it's a good, it can be a good approach primarily in males uh, who are uh, less, uh, or, or patients who are less concerned with uh, external midline incision. Uh, the platysma, the, the gastric musculature, as well as excess submental fat can be modified with this approach. And it can also be done in concert uh, with a traditional face or neck lift um, uh, or in lieu of that. Uh, so one of the things to keep uh, in mind, though, is, is it doesn't really impact uh, the lower face. Um, and, and so therefore, you know, you have to uh, bear that in mind uh, with counseling patients. Uh, and there are various different kinds of uh, excision designs. Uh, so that they can range from the more com complex, such as the, uh, this approach, which is uh, a Grecian urn approach um, with a Z-plasty that can allow uh, for more skin removal. Uh, but sometimes uh, a straight, more, a more straightforward technique can can be, uh, you know, just as just as effective. So, uh, this is a patient that had a, a simple uh, midline wedge excision. So we basically just took out the midline wedge uh, uh, of uh, neck skin. Um, this is his primary concern. He didn't like the way the fact that he was not able to wear a cuffed shirt uh, due to his excess skin laxity. And so one of the keys uh, when you know performing a direct uh, neck lift. Uh, uh, with just a simple wedge excision uh, is that uh, you need to be relatively conservative with the amount of skin that's excised to allow for a tension-free uh, closure. And so uh, you know, once, this, uh, once you remove the skin subcutaneous fat, uh, you can um, uh, undermine the uh, subplatysmally and, and form midline platysmoplasty prior to closure. And so this is uh, a patient three months after, and you can see he's, even though he has a midline scar, it's relatively inconspicuous and he has a pretty good correction of the cervical mental angle. So finally, it's uh, important to bear in mind, uh, you know, the complications that occur. The most common complication uh, with neck lifting is uh, a hematoma uh, that, that can occur in up to two to 15% of cases. Uh, major uh, expanding hematomas need to be, uh, usually occur in the first 12 hours and uh, require immediate return of the OR. Uh, if not if not addressed, uh, this can result in flap necrosis and scarring. Uh, sometimes patients can develop small hematomas that can be drained uh, with aspiration. Uh, I will usually uh, put surgical drains in uh, to help uh, you know avoid this problem and, and remove them uh, the, um, uh, post update one. Uh, nerve injury is another relatively common complication, and the most commonly injured nerve is the great auricular nerve. Uh, the, uh, motor nerve injury can also happen, uh, and the most commonly injured uh, facial nerve branch is the marginal mandibular nerve, uh, and has been reported in literature anywhere from 0.5% uh, to 2.5% uh, of cases. Uh, that said, it's uh, most often transient and uh, a good way to uh, uh, correct the symmetry and the smile uh, during the uh, fa uh, phase while the uh, mandibular uh, marginal mandibular nerve recovers is to inject uh, the contralateral 
a depressor labii inferioris with uh, Botox. Um, other complications can occur with uh, earlobe deformities, uh, which can be uh, which can occur if you uh, put too much tension on the uh, ear lobule during the skin closure, and this can be corrected with a, a V to Y uh, closure. And then, you know, finally, in a natural appearance, and this is where you know a vertical vector of lift is important. Uh, if you uh, if you redrape the skin in a more lateral direction, you can uh, uh, give a patient a more win a windswept appearance, which is um, you know, and a natural looking uh, uh, appearance. So uh, in summary, uh, you know, the keys are to understand the anatomy, the, the youthful anatomy, the specific anatomy that uh, the patient has um, that'll help guide uh, the treatment options that you're gonna offer. It's important to have a clear discussion of the goals of care um, and, and to be on the same page with the patient. In terms of technique selection, um, there are, are, are various different approaches, but I find that uh, you know, things that are, are reproducible uh, in your hands are, are, are usually uh, good approaches to, to stick with, uh, but it's also important to recognize what the limitations of those approaches are. Uh, so thank you, and I'll take uh, any questions. Thank you, Dr. Barrett. That was great. I think in the interest of time, I don't see any hands up, so we'll go on to Dr. Wick. Fantastic. You guys. Are you guys getting an echo now? Oh, no. We are. You'll need to mute one of your devices. I think that's the problem. I think. Uh, let me see. Let me see. Stop the audio. needs to be muted. Stop the audio as well on one of the devices. Yeah, there is it better it. now? Yes. Perfect. Yes. Great. And then um, I so go ahead and I do my- for joining us. I do a, let me do this up so I can hear you. Um, I do a, sorry, this is echoing me. I hit screen share. Correct, and yes. then I will show, and that's how this works, correct? Yes. Okay, let me find. So while Dr. Wick is sharing her screen, she's in private practice in St. Louis, and she'll be discussing hair restoration. So we'll be... Uh, it's the green button, Elizabeth. Yep, I, I, <clears throat> I clicked that, and then... Um, Let's see, it's not, it says like Safari preview, preview, and no, no, no. Um, there, this has to be it. Oh, it's making me, this is so strange. Zoom is making me give special allowances to, to allow, to show my screen. I've never seen this before. We have this super extra security Zoom. Yeah, I guess. Okay. I apologize. Okay. It says Zoom will not be able to record the context of my screen until it's quit. Um, what do you suggest I do? Quit and just reopen? Uh, yes, why don't you do that? I apologize, I know you That's got right. everybody. Liana, this is John. I'm still here. I'm just going to monitor to see <clears throat> when Elizabeth signs back on. Okay. I'm going to pause the recording in the meantime. Okay. It's fantastic. Thank you so much for bearing with me. Uh, I got a new computer and uh, came with some Zoom issues. 
Got it. Perfect. Okay. Um, I'm Elizabeth and I'm so thankful to be here. I'm going to be sharing a talk on geriatric hair loss and restoration. It is a topic I am very, it's not advancing. How do I advance my slide? There we are. Great. It's a topic that I'm very passionate about. I have no disclosures. Um, and so just some objectives. Uh, I'm, there's a lot of different ways that you can go about uh, the, the topic of geriatric hair loss. And because of the audience, I'm gonna focus largely um, on, on what I think might be new information to the group. Um, and, and so I'm, I would like for, the, for after listening to this for people to have a better understanding of the initial evaluation for hair preserve and treatment of hair loss and focus on hair preservation in the geriatric population. I also would like to help a little bit better understand patient selection for surgery, and what those surgical standards should be in hair restoration in this patient population, especially those people that already have an interest or a clinic that's a little bit geared toward the facial plastics, uh, uh, aging face population. They may already be sitting in your office. And then lastly, improve some of the referral confidence, such as when to refer to your dermatologist for biopsy, um, when to take on and feel more confident about um, treating some of the medical issues behind hair loss, and when to um, when when are some some maybe less obvious opportunities for doing a small surgical uh, restoration in patients that may be coming back or coming from another uh, physician that have had a scar that's not ideal or had a facelift where they've lost their their tuft of hair or their side their preregular tuft. Um, so just some of those things to improve upon. So if there's anybody that has lingering questions with more of the end game and the how-to on the surgical side, we touch on that here, but um, with, you know, I, I, people want to go home and I wanted to focus hopefully on some stuff that might be a little bit new that we can all add immediately to our clinic. Um, so very brief background. We know that in the geriatric population, hair loss is extremely common. 85% of men will have significant hair thinning by the age of 50. And the majority of women will have some level of hair loss by the age of 50. And, and whether this is good and bad, the majority of the impact is gonna be psychological. Um, the bad of that is that it, um, it often goes unrecognized, especially in the female population. It goes underestimated exactly how much that impacts their sense of identity, their sense of femininity in the community. Just here's a really brief, um, Outline is I'm going to focus on these, the listed kind of causes of hair loss. We know through training and clinical exposure, especially in the academic setting, that there is a wide range of causes for hair loss. But again, when I'm limiting it to the geriatric population and trying to do the due diligence or the due um, to this age population, I'm really going to focus on genetic causes of hair loss in the male and female population, such as androgenetic or otherwise known as androgenetic alopecia, female pattern hair loss. And then this is often concomitant in the geriatric population with something called chronic telogen effluvian. We'll review a little bit of what those words mean. And then, and then there's often, especially in women, just a general natural aging process that adds to the miniaturization of your hair follicles. Um, there's also going to be a, a larger group that is going to have some medical issues that are going to be contributing that you want to make sure you evaluate and rule out or treat. And then lastly, because of this special aging phase population in our surgical cosmetic practices, um, it's important to realize that there may be some room for improvement to add this as an adjunct to your practice for the facelift, brow lift patient. Also for those patients that have had a traumatic injury to the scalp, this can be a great option to do a surgical follicular unit extraction and implantation to help camouflage that for them. Really brief, this is, um, there's a lot going on here, but I think that um, it's nice to have a re reference because this is something that we don't see every day as otolaryngologists. It's nice to have a kind of a visual reference and protocol on how you start to consider the different causes for hair loss. And so when somebody comes in and they're predominantly complaining about early breakage, um, there's certainly you want to consider what they're treating their hair with and chemical treating, heat treating, but there are also some other um, organic causes or organic concerns with the actual caliber of their hair. And I often will reach out to my dermatologist for some of their special visualization to get a little bit of help with that. 
Um, so today we're really going to whittle down or the most, the most common causes that we see in the geriatric population or most common clinical characteristics are going to be some of that scarring with burns and trauma, but largely non-scarring alopecias. Um, and a little, the history can help us kind of tease out if this is shedding versus non-shedding. And the reason we, we think of shedding in this population is going to be a chronic telogen effluvian, um, which is, is basically when you continue to have that regular shedding, it just seems that they can't get ahead of it. They still have, doesn't appear like there's any periodic loss and overall see-through for the hair, but they just always complain of having a certain amount of hairs that are lost. That often comes along with a genetic or hormonal hair loss, especially in women, which then we look here in the non-shedding and we'll see diffuse pattern being female pattern hair loss and then unpatterned, which we see in the general population, such as the AA there means alo um, alopecia areata. Um, and the reason I'm focusing, is focusing again on what I do, what we will focus on here is that many times the other causes have already been diagnosed, whether somebody has seborrheic dermatitis or they have an autoimmune issue. Um, many times by the age of 65, they've at least been told that. So it's not to forget about those things, but it's not a new um unaddressed issue in this patient population. Like, like many times we're just unfamiliar with what patients can do if they're largely having a, just an aging process to their hair. Okay. So this is really brief. I, I basically, again, this is kind of reiterating the last slide, but it gives you a little bit more detail on in the aging population things to consider. Again, we're going to highlight genetics, Remember that there's an aging population of men that take testosterone, exogenous testosterone, and that is going to affect their hair unless they're one of the lucky um, genetic uh, few that are able to combat that through the their genetics of the different enzymes that they have on their scalp. But in general, if somebody tells me that they're taking testosterone, um, I'm either, you know, either they're a great candidate for, for a small surgical procedure to help density, or in general, I'll start them on some of the medications that we'll talk about. Stress is a huge factor that we don't get into enough. And whenever somebody goes through either a medical hospitalization or a medical um, insult or a stress insult, you know, they can start to have shedding and hair loss. Usually it's around three months following that. So people don't realize that it's not right away. They can last longer than you think, which is in the postpartum. Um, which is not this group, but it's an example. People don't know that that can last for up to 15 months after, after um, your, the baby's delivered. Other things in general, if patients are uh, vegetarian and low protein, um, you're gonna have a higher um, uh, diagnosis of diabetes and um, hypothyroid. You wanna make sure that you're aware of any kind of iron deficiency or anemias. Um, a lot of my patients are already on vitamins, but it's worth teasing out if those vitamins are checking all the boxes for their hair health. Often some of the, there's so many things out on the market now. I like Nutrafol. The Viscal is slightly cheaper, but they tend to cover all of your other vitamins as well. And then, you know, obviously traction, heat, chemicals can all hurt. And then again, talking about sickness, one of the interesting ones that I leave here or put on here is that we now know that up to 30% of patients that undergo um, chemotherapy will have chronic or permanent hair loss. The lucky thing about that is that it's non-scarring. So many of these treatments that we have for genetic hair loss in women and chronic telogen effluvian, effluvian will actually help our chemotherapy patients, um, which is a huge relief to them. Really briefly, so hair physiology can't have a hair talk without at least reviewing what we're always board tested on. So there's three main phases to the hair cycle. Antigen is the most important. It's the growth phase at any one time for our scalp specifically. This is, I will say this is different for hairs on the arm, leg and scalp, but on the scalp, the antigen phase usually lasts from two to six years and between 85 and 95% of your hairs are gonna be in this stage of growth. Um, this is if increasing this is what will increase hair length and hair, hair caliber. So finding ways to prolong the period of time that your hair is sitting in the antigen phase is going to improve the aesthetic and functional purpose of, of your hair. The other thing to always remember is, so catagen is this kind of transitional phase. Telogen is this resting and that lasts between three and five months. It's not exactly right, but if you think of a hundred weeks in antigen versus a hundred days in telogen, you have a better idea of how long 
um, these these cycles are in case they're there's shedding in response to some kind of exposure. It just helps me think about these things. Um, but anyway, telogen, you're you're kind of in a resting phase until you're ready to be shed and go back into your antigen phase. And it's also the only other real high yield thing on this um, to remember is that if patients are coming in and they're saying they're shedding 100 hairs, that's actually within normal. And that can make some patients that are referred by your loving dermatologist when you develop that relationship, they'll be happy to send you these patients. But it, it can be nice to be able to tell them, you know, that's actually normal. And let's just follow your hair density in addition to following that or kind of encourage them to distract themselves. But it's good to remember that up to 150, I, I call normal in my clinic. All right, so kind of going from there, um, the reason we care about those phases as far as miniaturization goes is that we know that um, the importance of this is that you have a larger full-bodied terminal hair that you see on the, can you see my, yeah, you, you see that over here on this left side. And then whether or not it's a testosterone um, uh, trigger or whether it's a multifactorial cause such as blood flow, antigen receptors, length of the antigen phase. The length of the antigen phase and blocking some of these um, scalp exposures can help reduce the number of cycles that you become susceptible to miniaturization. The less you go through that, the less you're at risk of having thin hair. And then eventually seen in men more than women, you can start to actually lose your follicle. And this will affect, not only does this diagram give a nice kind of idea of the process of, of hair loss in this population. It, I'll re-show this and kind of show where some of the medical treatments, where they're affecting this process. Um, and, it, and it's also, so we'll, we'll continue on, but it's, it's just a nice slide, I think, to remember that uh, the importance and the crux of the, the matter in this age population is how can we stop this process from moving forward? Where are the targets to, and it's very important to the, to the research and development of other medical treatments. It's not as important to the surgical treatment other than deciding that once those follicles are gone, you really can't use medicine or, or some of the adjunctive like PRP to do it. Really the only thing left is to transfer hairs once you've lost the follicle completely. This is very brief. So I prefer using the Norwood Hamilton scale as a otolaryngologist. I think we're more comfortable with just the Norwood scale. Largely the Norwood scale is basically in the middle. And I think the, the thing to remember is just that once you've passed into Norwood's level three, that's when you start to have true um, considered hair loss. Two or below is actually prepubertal and prepubertal and, and normal hair. So um, that's one of the main reasons. And then you kind of follow the severity. This also helps me decide you're going to see more geriatric patients with more severe hair loss. And the important aspect of that is that um, when you're considering transplanting hair in a male candidate, you need to keep in mind that you're transplanting non-sensitive hairs from the occiput. So meaning hairs that tend to be um, resistant to the effects of testosterone byproducts like DHT, you're going to be transferring those from the back of the hair to wherever there's a balding area or where the follicles are no longer existing. And when you have a severe hair loss, like you have in a Norwood six or seven, you're going to have more and more trouble giving a patient a natural full appearance. And so you need to counsel them on that because they just don't have the donors that they would have otherwise had if they had had met one of our audience members and had uh, hair, uh, hair preservation for a long period of time meaning that they hadn't lost as much hair. But anyway, um, moving on. I like to use the Savin. It's a modification of our, our Ludwig. Um, and I like to use this instead of the um, Ludwig is just one, two, and three. And I like the Savin because the majority of my geriatric patients that come in are really kind of between like the, the four middle boxes or the three middle boxes. And they're going to think that you are incredible if you can save them just one step on there, I promise. It's also important to, to keep in mind that when you're at an advanced stage, um, this is when you become both a hair, as a female, a hair uh, surgical candidate, but you're also a very challenging hair candidate because you tend to have a more diffuse 
a pattern of hair loss. And so you will have hair loss most likely in the area of what you would consider traditional donor location. And so you need to be very strategic about where you're placing those hairs in order to give the patient the most cosmetic effect. So you're not just placing new hairs in the large advanced um, full mid scalp and crown. You're going to be focusing those hairs along the frontal um, air, the region. And if they're, you're lucky enough to have, you know, say they're at a two, two and they, they part their hair one way, you're going to be going almost like at an L on whichever side that they're, they're parting just to give them the image of the most, because you're just never going to catch up to that kind of advanced hair loss um, without kind of coming to a donor mismatch. But anyway, this is just a reintroduction of how I, how you, you can grade and start to think about which type of surgical plan may be appropriate for them. Coming back, kind of rewinding. So I, the way I like to think about medicine and the medicine of hair um, is you break this down into you're going to do everything you can to preserve the hair that they do have. And you're going to look to these medical um, opportunities. And so when you think about the number one hit for male androgenetic hair loss, you're going to be thinking about the testosterone conversion to DHT. There's a good amount of research, vast amount of research that we know that DHT is a major trigger in male and some female uh, genetic hair loss. And those medications that are approved at this point is called their five alpha reductase inhibitors, finasteride, otherwise known as Propecia is the only FDA approved medication for hair loss. And it is an alpha two inhibitor. Dutasteride is newer and has, is having and gaining a lot of um, interest in research as a blocker of one and two. And so the way I like to think about it, or I tell my patients is finasteride is kind of the little brother to dutasteride. If finasteride orally is 70% effective, dutasteride, even at, at kind of reasonable doses, is probably 90 to 100% effective in blocking that uh, transferring from testosterone into DHT. The other ones that you'll see here, and I'm going to go to the next slide, is minoxidil, which I think a lot of people are familiar with. Most people are comfortable with prescribing it as a topical. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about um, what you can do with that. And then PRP also prolongs the antigen. Um, it does it differently. We're still learning about exactly. It's a very intricate interaction with how platelet-rich plasma brings an access of those good growth hormones but we're still very much learning about which, which growth hormones and growth factors are best for the stopping and appropriately controlling this process and which ones are not as helpful. And I think the future will be seeing even more distilling of, of exactly what we, can, what we can use there. But in general, minoxidil and PRP will prolong the antigen phase, which makes the hair longer and thicker. And then for women only anti-androgen effectors, so spironolactone is the number one anti-androgen medication. We'll just, we'll go into that just a little bit deeper with this single slide. I encourage, I included this um, slide just because if there's somebody out there that wants a little bit more on the ground, how do I tell my patients what to expect? What kind of dosing do I start them at? How long do I, do I tell them to continue to use it? Well, I felt like this was at least a good starting point. And so just to reiterate something that's really been amazing in my practice I'm kind of giving you a different look at it. So we think of finasteride and dutasteride, little brother, big brother. They're the heavy hitters, especially in male androgenetic hair preservation. Postmenopausal women, this works great as well. Um, in general, I put the dosing up there. In general, women will need a higher dose of finasteride, but, they, but men and women will find an improvement in the dosing that I've put in there. Um, both of them, we, it's important to understand that they've gotten press both of them for an association with sexual side effects. So um, again, dutasteride is slightly more potent. So it has a slightly higher um, sexual side effect percentage or patient. There's a higher percentage of patients that are exposed to that side effect. The good information with this is that against kind of some bad press about 10 years ago, we have proven that it is reversible, both with dose adjustments. So many patients can stay on the medication and they'll see that this goes away or is reversible with cessation of the medication. Um, also kind of exciting, dutasteride is gaining, is, is having, is um, under research right now for uh, possible prevention of prostate cancer. Um, I won't go into that deeper, but there is some, some interest in the medication for that as well as a kind of a second benefit. So minoxidil, most people think of this as Rogaine. I start all of my patients on some form of Rogaine, or sorry, um, minoxidil. 
for women, I often start at 2.5, or at least that's the goal. I'll start at that per day. Um, in men, I actually have worked with a compound pharmacy that I love here. And, and if anybody's interested in doing this, I highly encourage either reaching out to me and you can get in touch with them because they'll mail it anywhere. But it's really been incredible for patients that want to avoid the sexual side effects or can't tolerate that if an astride. I'll put that with a topical minoxidil and, uh, and a tretinoin. And, and the tretinoin helps one of the enzymes in the scalp so that actually this will turn patients that are not a responder to minoxidil and finasteride orally or minoxidil topically, it'll turn them into to responders. So um, kind of the summary statement is, this is kind of where I start patients that uh, are early in their hair loss or they're not surgical candidates. So a lot of women, a lot of men that are just not interested in surgery will have success by adding a minoxidil and finasteride or dutasteride together, whether they want to do that orally or they want to do that topically, I have an option for both of them. And, and I'll show you a couple uh, pictures later on. Um, the important thing for minoxidil is that when you're taking it, um, there is a, you know, a 9% risk of hypertrichosis. Usually if it's topically, it's going to be in the temporal region. If it's oral, it can be anywhere. Um, we happen to offer laser hair removal in my office. So this takes care of some of the lip, but unfortunately really isn't great for sideburn areas. And so you just have to let them know. And if they're really, um, that, and they can make their own choice. I've had some patients that is listed uh, to have some nausea that usually goes away, but it's good to let them know. So they're not surprised and anxious about it. And then lastly, the one that's, um, it, we know it's, a, it was originally, minoxidil was originally studied as a uh, blood pressure medication. And so um, recent study came out that up to five milligrams per day, it'll change your blood pressure by a few points. So it's really not um, something I, I tell patients, I tell patients, but I don't worry about it. But what I do think of is that some of them will have leg edema um, and, and, and just kind of um, water retention. It's something to remember, even if they have that water retention, they don't necessarily have the blood pressure changes, but it's something to, to keep in mind and let them know it will go away if they take, if they stop taking the medication. Right after that, for women, not for men, but I also do like to see if they will tolerate spironolactone. The nice thing about giving that to patients that are on minoxidil at the same time is that spironolactone is a diuretic. So if somebody's going to have some mild leg swelling from the minoxidil, the spironolactone will kind of taper that off. And it's the number one treatment for female pattern hair loss and hirsutism, um, even though it's not uh, FDA approved. I also tell patients and have listed it here that the target is really to get them to 200 milligrams per day. If I, if, and, and what I mean by tolerating that is that they, one of the side effects is postural hypotension. So if they happen to be lightheaded or have kind of blo low blood pressure to begin with, I work with their primary care physician. I communicate with them and make sure that they're on board and okay with it. Um, also, if they have uh, uh, kidney issues, you know, I'm going to be taking labs before I get on. I'm going to put them on. I'm going to take labs probably two to four weeks after they're on just to make sure that they're doing okay in this population. If a patient is 45 and under, I don't do that. But in our population we're speaking about today, I do actually take labs. I work with the primary care physician just to make sure that we're all on the same uh, page because um, you want to make sure you're not having uh, hyperkalemia and they're not having um, blood pressure issues, like I said. But it's nice to to pair the minoxidil with the spironolactone for the main side effect of, of leg swelling or not. Um, and then the last kind of bullet point that I've put here is just to kind of reiterate that for those first two bullets, whether it's finasteride or dutasteride that they're choosing to use in combination with minoxidil, I've had a lot of patients love the idea of this compound. And if you reach out to somebody in your area, for instance, I'm able to offer that at $65 to $100 a month, which isn't cheap by any means, but compared to some of the options out there in a, in a billion dollar industry, it's, I'm saving them hundreds of dollars a month. And so for some people that can be a lifesaver. Um, just to reiterate how much you can get out of just medic medication. So um, this on the, on the left-hand side is a guy that's six months into, which is pretty incredible compared to even some of the literature they talk about having these patients on and expecting to, to be on for 12 or more months before you see anything. Um, this is actually dose dependent. So I, I have an interim picture where he certainly has improved already from the left-hand side, but this is after six months of topical dutasteride and um, a vitamin 
vitamin like hair kind of mix form. And then on the right hand side, this is a combination of, of um, again, the compound with dutasteride, um, some PRP and also um, a vitamin. So this is all preservation focused. None of this is, is surgical. So I, I just like sharing that with patient with, with you guys so that you know that there is an opportunity to really give true improvement. And uh, these patients have been really happy. So as a bridge, I'm almost getting to the end here. So um, leaving hair preservation alone, kind of moving into what are some of the other tools that we have in our toolbox that don't require patients to go to surgery. That's what I kind of, I highlight here. These have all been demonstrated to have an improvement or an um, uh, advantage uh, on your hair fullness, hair see-through um, and actual growth. Um, low level light therapy, I, I, don't, I don't recommend it a ton because the issue with low level light therapy is even though we've seen that there's a 15% per, improvement, these patients have to use it 30, 30 minutes a day, really 30 minutes a day, but it's, you know, some will have improved with every other day, but really I tell patients they need to use it every day. And for women, they often have enough diffuse loss that light has to get to their scalp. And so for women, it, they have to be very uh, bald. They have to have be very severe in order for this to give them a benefit because the light is just not getting through their scalp. And for men, if they're doing this, um, it's probably going to be an adjunct to surgery as well. Like most men are not going to be satisfied with the cost of this for the level of improvement doing it as a monotherapy, but it's out there and it has been proven to work. And, it, and if somebody's really looking to do anything they can, it's an option that I, I, I lead them toward. The next one that I do use a good amount is platelet rich plasma series. Um, the important aspect to know is this is pre publication data, but um but new data is showing that three out of four women uh, versus one out of two men will improve the series of six. It's important to understand that this is synergistic. If somebody's going to try platelet-rich plasma um, injections and they're just doing one, they're going to be largely underwhelmed. In my office, I recommend at least four to start. And then I average, I quote them a 25% uh, improvement. And I, and I base it on some of the previous data that's been out there and some of this pre-publication data that um, Sarah Wasserbauer has, has been sharing and um, with me from California. And, and, you know, my patients have been extremely happy with that. The problem with PRP is that um, two things, you have to counsel your patients that it's going to be variable in their satisfaction or outcome in men, if they don't have follicles. So I use a, I have um, video trichoscopy in my office. And so I can show them here, you, these are the, these are the velus hairs that should respond to this treatment, or, you know what, you've lost these follicles and your density is just not there. You may have some improvement in the thickness of what, of the caliber of the hair that you already have, but you may be underwhelmed after this because the only way to put hair where it's not is surgically transplanting it. So number one, you have to, you, you either have to tell them you don't know if there's enough hairs to have a, a, a benefit or, or have some kind of trichoscopy device, which is not, doesn't have to be expensive. It can be a hundred dollars to get better at looking at their scalp and telling them, yes, you're a good candidate or no, you're not. And then lastly, the last bullet there demonstrates, you know, their own stress level is going to affect the amount of growth factors in their blood. And that's just up to, at this point with the technology that we have, that's not something that we can dictate for them. So I tell them to drink a lot of water to get as much volume as we can. But I, I mean, I don't, I don't know that that's really doing anything for them. Uh, I just know that it's trying to keep their stress level down and get as much out of the treatment as I can. Um, and then this is just a real brief line about what we do. We get 40 cc's of blood. We put it in a, a 10 minute centrifuge. Uh, we get usually between nine to 12 cc's of, of the platelet rich plasma that we then extract out and I will numb up their scalp um, with a common, just kind of standard buffered lidocaine mix. And then I'll use a 30 gauge subdermal injection. So I'm getting right about between like three to four millimeters in the subdermal, uh, actually it's probably more like two to three um, at the right depth. And then the other two that I don't use very often, but it does, I, it has been shown to help. I like the call I've used several patients have really liked the microneedling and that's really just stimulating for the completely the natural aging process and stimulating the collagen stimulation, the keratinocyte um, proliferation, 
prolonging the antigen phase. And then lastly, fat injections here is a great adjunct to follicular unit extraction into areas of scar. And then a very brief, again, it's not beyond the scope of this conversation or this presentation, but I welcome people's inquiries. Make sure I stay on task. Um, I welcome people to ask me about details, uh, anything that I can offer as far as our clinical forms that I use and in intake or our surgical forms in order to plan for surgery. I'm happy to have you reach out, but just as a real brief kind of introduction to hair restoration, quote unquote plus, there's a really nice um, image here that kind of splits where we are as far as the gold standard for surgery. So uh, FUE stands for follicular unit extraction. FUT is, is basically strip surgery. Um, and, and basically the main difference is that in follicular unit extraction, which has become the gold standard and tech and really what my patients, when they come in, they're looking for is what I offer over other places in the, in the, in the current city that I'm in, even though it's relatively, um, widely accepted. Um, it's just not something that a lot of people do where I'm at, um, is follicular unit extraction. And basically we take, um, a small rotating knife, if you will, cylindrical knife, and we encapsulate, as you can see on the very bottom aspect of the left-hand side of this image, we basically encapsulate the full follicular unit in about, in, in, in these, the smallest range from 0.8 millimeters up to one millimeter, depending on the patient's hair, collagen, and just characteristics. Um, we take that out, we put it in a bath that's um, chilled to four degrees Celsius. Um, and then we have a combination of PRP um, and ATP that help keep it alive and robust. Um, while we're working there, somebody, we have, we have, uh, I have an assistant that is counting the hairs so that we have a total count by the end. And then, um, once we're completed with that, we'll flip the patient over and then I will design if it actually, it's already designed a hair, a hair, a hairline, but we'll use between one and two, um, haired hair follicles. I should go back and say that each follicle is going to have between one and four hairs. And so at the hairline, I'm going to use a combination of one and mainly two uh, hair, hair follicles for camouflage. And as I go back and fill in for density, I'll go up to three and it'll be a combination of two, three, and then further back up in my mate, use four, it just depends. Um, you have basically the same process for strip surgery except what you do instead of taking them individually, instead of taking each individual follicle out and placing it in a bath that'll keep it from desiccating, what you end up doing is you will do a, skin, a scalp laxity assessment to know exactly how much skin you can take out. You will have done a trichoscopy to know what the follicle density is per uh, square centimeter. And then you will and, and you'll have already determined kind of what your goal is for density on the scalp and where, and then you will basically take out a, a piece of a piece of their, their hair bearing scalp in the occipital region as kind of shown here. And the important aspect on this side is just that you do need uh, highly trained techs to cut these hairs and not transect them and save them and basically do the work that your punch biopsy or your, your it's not a punch biopsy, it's your, your, your punch is doing, as you can see in this image, that's cutting it down to each follicle. Um, and the, the reason, P, the two things to remember is the reason patients like this, number one, is that it's, it's a shorter recovery. You know, the pain is less. So you're kind of your hair is camouflaging those wounds within, you know, three to seven days. Whereas you're going to have to have sutures taken out at day 10. If you're doing a strip surgery, the pain is greater. I usually have a longer restriction than activity for my patients. Um, and blood pressure elevation. And, um, and the other issue is that even though there may be less total square centimeter of scar for a long strip surgery, it's more noticeable. And so you're going to have, the patient's going to have to commit to keeping their hair longer than a certain amount. Whereas you can have your hair cut to about four millimeters, three millimeters, and not perceive the FUE scars. It's not fair to tell patients that it's scarless, but it can be virtually scarless. Um, from very short distance away. And within four days, three days, really all you may see is just kind of a sheen of redness. It's, it's pretty impressive and fun. So I kind of list what I tell my patients and as far as expectations following surgery, you know, five days, the, the grafts are firmly rooted, two to four weeks. Uh, your scab should have shed by 10 days. The earlier they shed, just like anywhere else, 
the better healing you're going to have for any kind of incision. Um, and that's true here. But any, any of the hairs that have happened to not fall off with scabs will start to fall out by four weeks, three to four months, you'll start to have those grafts come back in. I tell my patients four months or longer because I want them to not be anxious, but also because they may not see these hairs. They're so small at four months. Um, I offer, I, I like my patients to be on a finasteride or dutasteride because that reduces the period of time for regrowth. Um, and I recommend that to anybody that's doing this. I usually like to have patients either on a topical or oral 5-alpha uh, alpha reductase for three months or more prior to especially doing anything on the crown. But you can, and largely you can reduce this time to regrowth. At six months, regardless, patients are going to be seeing hair. And, and at 12 months, you're at a nine, almost your full result. In patients that need, a, need two surgeries because they're just totally, they have a huge area for recipient sites, um, or they really want a ton of fullness and their expectations are high, I usually recommend splitting that between two surgeries. This is when they start to come back to me or, or if they never thought they would want to, they'd like the surgery. And this is when they start to come back. Um, complications just to be aware of the most common are going to be shock loss. It's not really a complication. I tell my patients about it. it you can't predict who's going to have it. These are these patients where basically, um, the hair, the pre-existing hair goes through enough shock that it goes, it's, it's solicited through telogen and start shed all at the same time. Um, donor recipient mismatch. I briefly touched on before. These are those geriatric patients that have severe enough hair loss that you do not have enough hair in the donor region to do a, have them have a nice result, um, because their recipient site is so large. Um, and then, and then, you really need to counsel your patients appropriately. If you have a 75 year old, they can't, you know, they're, they're not going to have a six centimeter forehead. They, they need to match the rest of their face. And when it doesn't match, either they're set up for losing more hair later and looking unnatural, or they're just going to look a little bit unnatural from the beginning. Um, and then other complications is if you do surgery on somebody that has a scarring alopecia or an autoimmune alopecia, that's still um, active. Um, that's going to be really sad because that hair is, you're going to have lost that hair. It's going to be attacked by, by the underlying, uh, pathology that was there from the beginning. Um, this is brief. I, you know, this can be a reference if somebody wants to look at this later. So this is basically my initial treatment summary. This is how I take all of this information and I approach it. I do an initial evaluation focus significantly on the history, um, their history or family history, um, scalp health. I do, a, I look at their scalp and then these are my initial labs. I always thought this was helpful. Almost like when I did a rheumatology lecture, when they gave me the labs that I would want. So this is what I've included here. These are your initial labs that you want yourself or a, um, primary care physician or somebody else to have gotten or for the patient to bring with them if they've already had them done, but this is what you want to touch on. And then for women, this is what I start with because they're really hard surgical candidates most of the time. And, uh, and patients do well with this. I tell them they usually need to choose more than one treatment and they need to expect 12 months on it. And that's how I get patients to really get behind that and, uh, and be happy and satisfied. And then for men, Men are usually an easier surgical candidate, but again, do tasteride with minoxidil, whether they want to do oral or topical, um, they usually have a very nice response. And, and I will recommend uh, PRP as long as on trichoscopy, they have those follicles to be treated. Um, the future of, of this, I think, is going to be cryotherapy. Right now, there is there are people that will take young people's hair and 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 crowd preserve it. It's not in the United States. It's a, uh, it's in England. And if somebody wants their contact information, I can give it to them. This is not in the geri usually in the geriatric population, but it is interesting. And there's more and more research being done with the ability of exosome research. Um, it's just not currently at what I would like it to be at this point, but I do think that a lot of people believe that uh, this is where it's going to go. And, and basically hair regeneration is the future. Um, I'd like to thank Thank you again. I love this area of medicine. It's something I didn't get a ton of as a resident, but I was lucky enough to be at the University of Miami and, and get to learn from uh, Jeff Epstein and Sarah Wasserborough has been wonderful since graduating. And um, it gives me a lot of uh, reward, internal reward, treating these patients that are so thankful to uh, finally have answers. Um, yeah, so thank you for bearing with me. I know it's late.
Thank you, Dr. Wick. That was great. I, um, I really enjoyed it. I have a question for, which is a different population, and this is my bias because I treat patients with head and neck cancer, but have any of these medications been tested in patients wanting to regrow hair after having had radiation you know, to the face, especially if they've had some kind of parotid um, you know, cancer with, with radiation to the area where it's really affected their, their, not, their, not only their facial hair, but also their scalp hair? Um, as far as the, so you're asking, has there been any research about, you're talking about FUE into like radiated, like, like a free right, any of these, the, the, the FUE, the hair transplant, the, the medications, especially, you know, things that, um, you know, would not require further surgery. I was just wondering if anyone had looked to see how well that might work in previously radiated tissue to help regrow hair. It's a great question. In general, we consider radiated regions is basically similar to scarring. Mm. And so um, the medical treatment is probably not going to be, is considered, it's really unlikely to to reverse those scarring because it's just like you've lost the follicles. So anytime you have a process that has removed or eradicated the follicles, um, either through miniaturization or scarring, you're not gonna really be able to use a a non completely non-surgical medication. But what is promising, and I actually had uh, uh, Dr. Pipcorn here when I was a resident ask about this, uh, is, is you may have some success doing an FUE or doing grafting into a, a healthy free flap directly into it and not adding anything. And then the other thing you can consider is, is if it's radiated, you may consider doing a graft with fat injections. I don't think you'd have much, I don't think you can expect much success uh, into scarred tissue that's been basically from radiation without adding some kind of pluripotent cells that can start to heal. And especially because the bigger that that gets, the farther your blood supply gets from the center. And so you really kind of have to counsel patients that, but there isn't a lot of data on the size of that. Does it make sense that mm -hmm. there's not a lot of data of like after two centimeters of, of um, diameter, like we have on some of the, the malo the, uh, on, on uh, local flaps, like what will work. I would love to have like a, um, a comparison study on an area of scarring or an area of radiation, how big it has to be to not respond or to respond to a combination of, of graphs with fat injections. Cause I think that might be a real option for what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much, everybody, for your participation. Thank you to our speakers. Again, it was a great uh, discussion and uh, really interesting to see what advances have been made in this subfield of otolaryngology. So I hope everyone enjoyed it. Uh, this will be uploaded to the ASCO YouTube site, so you'll be able to refer your colleagues to it and uh, be able to watch this on demand uh, for great educational content. So thank you, everybody. Have a great night.